website is watchmanscry.com. And in today's sermon that you're about to hear, we're going to go very deep, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to study the abomination of desolation. There's a lot of opinions about that topic, and many of those opinions are at odds with one another. And you know, folks, since we are there now, we need to get to the bottom of it. We need to understand it. And it's very, very important that the body of Christ gets a hold of what it really means. Because that event is going to play a role in the behavior of a lot of Christians. Now, to get a hold of the things I'm going to share on this program, it's going to take several times listening to this sermon. Because we're going to go deep into the scriptures. We're going to look into what the Bible says about it. Because the answer is found in the Bible, ladies and gentlemen. We can know what it is. But I need to give this caveat. There is a danger with a portion of the body of Christ who are looking for this thing to take place in the wrong way. And if we are expecting it to happen in a certain way, and it doesn't happen that way, and, and if it's another curveball from God and it happens different, then the body of Christ, the remnant, the bride, who is looking for his soon return, isn't going to know what happens. So I want to invite you to get a pen and paper, get your Bible, get a highlighter, and take a lot of notes. And please share this message with everybody that you know. And I consider this sermon, the contents of this message, to be one of the most important messages that I have ever shared. We need to understand what time it is, folks. The body of Christ needs to understand the prophecies. We need to understand the signs to look for. Because if we don't, if we look for signs that are not going to happen, or if we look for signs because of misinterpretation, and they don't happen, and then the real ones do happen, it's going to throw a lot of people off. It's going to throw people off guard. And unfortunately, it's going to cause a number of people to perish. It's going to cause people not to make it, to fall by the wayside, to be knocked down by the enemy, to be deceived by Satan. And I don't want to see that happen with you, my friends. So please make it a point to listen to every part of this message from start to finish. Every part of the message that you're about to hear is very important. And also, I want to ask this. Please remember us in your support. We can't do this without your help, ladies and gentlemen. By you helping us, people are getting saved, folks. I'm getting reports. These messages are drawing people back to God. And it's because of you who are helping support us that's making that possible. So we're working together, and I want to thank you for that. This is an ongoing labor. This is what we do. We're on the front lines to warn God's people and to yank them out of deception. And with your help, we can do that. Our address is Watchman's Cry, P.O. Box 157, Priest River, Idaho, 83856. Or you can go to our website at watchmanscry.com and contact us there. I will also leave a link below in the description where you can click to go to our website where there's a, a place that you can donate. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Also, I want to ask this. The, if you have not subscribed, press the subscribe button. And also like this video so that the algorithm will give us recommendations with other people who are on YouTube. These messages are reaching thousands of people, ladies and gentlemen. And I thank you for your prayers. Please continue to remember us. If you are interested in attending one of our future services, you can email me. There's a, a link below to go to the website in the description. You can email and we can go further from there. But we do welcome like-minded believers because we have been having some great sessions of worship. So with that, enjoy this message, and I pray that it will bless you. Discovering the end times takes wisdom. It takes understanding. And in order to get that, it takes effort. So when we get saved, we're redeemed. Our spirits get renewed. Every one of us had to do that. Those of you listening on YouTube, hopefully you did that. There are some of you listening that have not done that yet, but you need to. You need to get saved you need to get right with God because we're running out of time. God is waking up the body of Christ. He is waking up the bride. He is waking up the remnant, the remnant, and he is unsealing the, the prophecies. He's opening our eyes, and one by one, we're starting to see some things, right? Because that first horse, it's obvious that it's riding, and Corona is conquering the world. We see it's doing it, and the toxin, people are willingly walking to the gallows. And inserting that thing in their arm 
and they're putting it in their family members, and we already have the numbers, we're seeing it. There's an explosion of poison taking place. And you know what? If there's still some of you watching this, right now, if you're watching this and you still want to defend that thing, I don't know what help you, you can get, seriously. Because there's too much information. You can go to the VAERS website and see that thing is killing. And they're only reporting 1% to 10%. The true number is, is insane. Israel is almost 100% toxinated, and now they're having another outbreak. Explain that. The Carnival Cruise had a, a ship, a cruise line, that were all, you have to be toxinated, and they had an outbreak. And we're seeing this over and over and over. We're seeing it. And in the, in the coming weeks and months, ladies and gentlemen, if you are taking this thing lightly, you need to wake up right now because we're there. We're in the tribulation. And I know that this is not the way you might have expected it because most of us expected that there would be a, a big announcement that, first of all, all, a bunch of people disappeared and the babies are empty from the nurseries and the pregnant mom's stomachs went flat and all that. So all of a sudden, people, the, it, it's the aliens. We were expecting the blame on the aliens, right? We were, right? But now something didn't happen. That didn't happen. We're still here. And now we have this thing that is shoving down our throat. And every one of us are going to have to make a choice. Are we going to take it? Are we not? Are we going to hold out? Are we going to hold the line? Are you going to hold the line? You have to, my friend. Ladies and gentlemen, you have to hold the line. Do not give up. The devil wants to kill you. He wants to kill your family members. He wants to destroy you because, because that's what he does. And he knows this time is short. And the spirit of deception has been allowed to be loosed on the earth. It's here now. And isn't it amazing how many people it's deceiving it's in the church? A few weeks ago, I gave the sermon about the wheat and the tares. We're seeing it, aren't we? The tares are among us. They're amongst us. So what are we to do? How do we navigate this thing? Here's the part that's throwing the curveball to us. And God has really, really resonated within my spirit to do my part, to try to help what I can do, as well as if you're a watchman or if you're a preacher or you're a pastor, you're watching this, I want to just challenge you, get up to speed fast. And if you are a pastor and you were formally trained in the cemetery, I mean the seminary, then it's important for, for you to, if you are holding on to the traditional philosophy of men about how the rapture is going to take place and all of that, you need to take your arm and throw it off the table and, and ask God to rebuilt fresh on what's really going on because it's obvious we're there it's obvious the first horseman is riding right now he's deceiving the world and that toxin is going to kill billions of people it is eventually we have the, the spring or i'm sorry the fall is coming in the next few weeks it's going to start getting cold the kids are going back to school and what we see happening in australia with the lockdown and that madness the tyranny and it's insane have you guys seen what's going on down there? It's crazy. Australia had their winter, and they're coming out of winter into the spring. So what is happening in Australia, they're the test model. That's the, the coming attractions. That's the trailer of what's coming here to the northern hemisphere this winter. So ladies and gentlemen, get your heart right with God, and it is time now. Yes, we need to be watching, but it is so important now to really, really try to understand what the prophecies say and how this thing's going to play out. Now, of course, we're probably not going to understand everything and we'll, we're bits and pieces as God opens our eyes. And I'm going to go into this and I'm going to explain some things, but it is very important. Everyone that's listening and whenever you open the Bible and you're alone, try to get into this habit. Have the prayer of blind Bartimaeus. Blind Bartimaeus, remember him? He, oh, who, who's, who's, who's that walking Bartimaeus asked when there was a crowd, Jesus was in, walking through town and he started screaming, who is it? And they said, it's Jesus. And he started screaming, oh, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And he was making a scene. And everyone was embarrassed for him. He didn't care, though. He wanted his eyes. So the intensity that Bartimaeus cried out to God is the same intensity that God's remnant needs to cry out to God to have our eyes open. We need our eyes open ladies and gentlemen, and if anyone thinks that, that they have it all figured out because you read it in a book that was written decades ago, I just have this to say. You can hold on to that, and if, it, if it's a holy cow, I love that term, my wife shared that one with me, the holy cow. 
and, and you can't let go because, no, no, I know how it's going to happen, Nathan. It's going to happen this way. And, and so if you are really, really convinced of that, go ahead. You can leave it on the table if you want, but I ask this. Ladies and gentlemen, brethren of the faith, we need to make it. So we can't be, it's not a roll of the dice and a roulette wheel. We need to make sure we have a hold of the truth. And it says in Isaiah, his truth will be our shield and our buckler. The truth. So right now, if you were to go into the average church today on Sunday and you were to ask, how is prophecy going to play out? You would get a rendition of, depending on which church you went to. You, we would hear this or this or this or this or this. And if they're all different from one another, then not all of them can be correct. So what we need to do is find out if the one we have is correct. And if, it, if none of them are correct, we have to find out what is correct. How do we do that? Does it have to stay a mystery? Does it have to be mysterious and, and off limits to the average lay person who's not a Bible scholar? No, you can know, but it just takes opening the Bible and asking God with that intensity that I just mentioned, the prayer of Bartimaeus, God, open my eyes. Because James says, if anyone lacks wisdom, ask. And I cannot say this enough, ladies and gentlemen, ask, ask, ask. When you're driving the car, Ruben, you said you're a trucker. When you're traveling, just keep, open my eyes, Lord. Open my eyes. And, you know, we get so used to saying those words, but this time we really have to have our eyes open so that we can see the mysteries because there's some crazy things going on. And it's going to get very, very dark. It's already dark now, but in the coming days and weeks and months, folks, it's going to get so dark. That's even one of the judgments a third of the sun and the moon and the stars gets dark. And in the darkness also, there's going to be a release of dark spirits and dark entities. And I know it's scary. You don't want to hear this, folks. Some of you, don't. I don't want to hear that kind of stuff. Demons are going to be loosed upon the earth and they're going to go out and have breakfast, lunch, and dinner on every one of you guys or try to. They want to eat you. They want to eat your soul. They want to eat your spirit. They want to eat the soul of your kids and your teenagers and your parents. They want to eat the truth. They want to take it away. And they're going to poke you. And they're going to try to give you a flat tire. And they're going to try to make you guys fight with one another. That's what they do. But we have to have the light of God. We need to have it, ladies and gentlemen. So today, I'm going to talk about the abomination of desolation. Now, that is a very, very, very popular term, and there's been hundreds of books written about it. There have been sermons written about it, given about it, produced about it. There's been movies, and there are so many people that have a rendition of how that thing's going to play out in their mind. But if you listen to my sermon last week, now, this is Tribulation Boot Camp. In the message last week, part two, I stated that the way that we expect Bible prophecy to happen is not the way it's going to happen. It's not. And I'm going to prove it today. And I, I want to ask this. I want to challenge you to take notes on, on this sermon that you're about to hear and listen to it and then listen to it again. You're going to have to probably listen to it two to three to four, five. Seriously, I'm going to give so much information. The abomination of desolation. What is that? Well, first of all, let me preface with this. When Jesus rose again on the first day of the week, he appeared to the ladies. The ladies saw him first, right? The ladies. I, I love that, that the ladies, they cared to uh, dress him up, and, and they, Mary was crying. Where'd they, I don't know where they laid him. Mary, and oh, it's you. I, I love that, that the, the women have that, See, guys are cavemen. We, we don't think about dressing up. If, if we did, if guys did, why weren't they there? The women were there. So God bless the women. So God, Jesus appeared to them first, and then he appeared to the 11 because Thomas was missing. And then there was an interesting thing that took place. In Luke chapter 24, I think that's right, there, there's an account of when Jesus rose again and he was... Appearing, yeah, uh, 2413. It says, Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. 
And they talked together of all the things which had happened. So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. So all of a sudden Jesus appears and he's walking with them, the risen Lord. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. He kept their eyes closed. And then he said, what kind of conversation is this? What are you guys talking about? And they said, are you the only stranger? Have you not known what happened? And they start explaining how Jesus was a great teacher and Jesus is just listening to them. And then, verse 24, and a certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it, like the women said, but they did not see him. So Jesus is listening to these two people, God bless them, talk about him. But they weren't saying he's the Messiah. The Messiah came and he was born. He fulfilled all the prophecies and praise God. We saw miracles where it's happening. It's all true. They didn't say any of that. They were just saying he was a good teacher and he was mistreated. And so Jesus is listening to him. And look what Jesus says right here. Jesus says in verse 25, Oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things to enter into his glory? And then he went from, he started from Moses, Genesis, and he went through all the, the writings of Moses, and then he went to the prophets and the minor prophets, and he went through all of it and explained himself in there. And as they were listening, they were going, oh, wow, you want to come have dinner with us and, or have a meal? And, and so he said, sure. And then you know the story. He breaks bread, disappears. And the one thing that they said that was, I, I love this. They said, didn't his words burn, in verse 32, didn't his words burn in our heart while he talked? His words, didn't they burn down to the spirits? And folks, the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. And when the, the true word of God touches us and we hear it, it goes down beyond the surface of our skin, into the marrow, into the sinew, and it's able to chop and cut all them spider webs and that mess that we have inside us. The Word of God can come in and cleanse us and set us straight and get us back in line. The Word of God is powerful. It's the light. It's the truth. It's the salt. It's the life. It's, the it's everything. It's everything. So Jesus said to them, O oh, foolish ones, slow of heart. Now that word foolish one, Actually means, if you look at the original in the Greek, it, it can mean unwise. So actually he's saying, you unwise ones, did, why can't, don't you know the Son of Man had to suffer these things? Why don't you know? Why? You know, it's interesting that so many times when Jesus was listening to the people talk or the disciples talk, he would say, you guys, face pump, come on, don't you get it? Don't you get it? So he told them, you're unwise. Foolish one means unwise. So they were not wise. They did not understand the, what, what had just happened. So that's a lesson for us. And I keep saying this over and over and over. If we're going to make it through the tribulation, we need to have wisdom. If you want to make it, you need to be wise. Now, if, we, if you think you're wise already, but, you, but there's some holes in your theology or your eschatology, or you're looking at, at eschatology, the teaching of the end times, the understanding of the end times, if you do not understand it correctly, it's going to get so crazy and so scary and so weird that if we don't really have in our hand to know, because Jesus said, watch, and he tells us to be wise. If we don't know what's going on and we don't understand it, there's a possibility that some people are going to fall for deception, and we're watching it happen now. How many people in the churches are, are promoting the toxin? So many. So Jesus said, you're unwise. And then he said, slow of heart. That word for slow, if you look in the Greek, it, it means sleepy of heart, slumber of heart. And there's also one of the definitions is, is stupid. It's in there. If you look it up in blue letter, sluggish of heart, in your heart to believe. You are, your, your heart is slow to believe. It's sluggish to believe. We cannot operate that way anymore. Ladies and gentlemen, we have to be awake and know what is happening. We have to be able to decode it because if we don't, again, here's the choice. If we know the truth, then possibly we can live a little bit longer. If we don't know the truth, you're going to die, period. 
That's the choice. If you don't know the truth and you're telling your, your, your family members, you're telling your children the wrong rendition of the truth, they're going to die. If you tell your parents a rendition of prophecy that's wrong, they're going to die. If you tell yourself or your spouse or, or a friend or you're trying to preach to baby Christians and you're telling them wrong, you're killing them. That's how serious this thing is, folks. We're in the tribulation. People are going to die. So by the time we're done, half of the world's going to half of the world is going to perish with the judgments. And then toward the end of the tribulation, we're going to have some crazy earth changes go on. And by the way, it's not climate change, folks. So don't repeat that. That's what the world is saying. We just came out of the summer, and and what we saw in the summer with the temperatures and the heat waves and the destroyed crops from coast to coast. From Washington here in the Northwest, we lost a, a, a chunk of our crop. And then in the East Coast, and then you go to Europe, they lost their crop because of the heat. Right now we're watching the judgment of God on, God on this earth, but the world's not going to admit that. They're calling it climate change. Therefore, their model is, is getting even more steam, bull, bulldozing ahead, because they're lying to everybody. And how many folks believe that? How many folks go to church and believe in climate change? We have to be wise, ladies and gentlemen. So when Jesus said, don't be slow of heart, we need to take notice of that. We need to be wise to understand. Now, let's look into the abomination of desolation. The word, that, that phrase, abomination of desolation, sounds very mysterious, doesn't it? It sounds, it, there's something to it. It's cryptic. Wow, what does it mean? What does it mean? We have abomination and then desolation. What does it mean? I don't know, but it sounds, it, it's, it's scary. It's cool. I don't know. So a lot of Christians don't even know what it means, but they share it. And here's the rendition that's being told to 90 over, I would say 95 to 99% of, of the church right now. The church is being told right now that the abomination of desolation is a part of prophecy, and you guys have heard it too. If you're listening on, on, on at home on YouTube, you have heard that the tribulation starts on day one. The rapture happens, marriage supper of the Lamb. So we're, we're having the potluck up in heaven. We look down, and then the war of Ezekiel happens, Ezekiel 38 and 39, and then the weapons were burned for seven years. And then the Antichrist is going to show up, the Antichrist, this guy is going to show up out of the ashes of, because a lot of people disappeared, and the remnants of World War III, the leftovers because Ezekiel 38 happened. So now the earth is smoking, and there's like at, when the, the, the towers fell, remember that? I was real dusty in, in New York. So Christians have this image, and I remember seeing, I, I thought it myself, so there's this image of ruins, and smoke, and the world's going to say, we need someone to save us and help us rebuild. And then that's when the Antichrist shows up. So he arrives and says, hey, I can fix everything. And so everyone puts their faith in him. He takes over the world. And then Israel rebuilds the temple. All this happens right at the beginning of the tribulation. Israel has the rebuilt temple and starts the sacrifice. And they're going to do the daily sacrifice. They're looking for the red heifer. By the way, have you guys... Heard, they're looking for the red heifer. How many of you guys heard that? And then they're going to do it. Okay. But the sacrifice Israel does is the daily sacrifice. Because we're told also that the daily is going to get stopped right in the middle of the tribulation, the daily sacrifice. So Israel's going to sacrifice every day for three and a half years. 1,260 days. Which is 1,260 sacrifices. And then in the middle of the seven years... That guy over here, the hero, is going to say, huh, what are they doing over there? And he's going to get on a plane, go to Jerusalem, and while they're having the sacrifice, he's going to walk in. What are y'all doing? Get out of the way. And he's going to sit in the temple where they're doing the sacrifice. Get it out of the way. And he's going to say, turn on the cameras, everybody. Everyone needs to hear this. Bring it in close. Zoom in. Okay, I'm about to say something that you've been waiting for a guy like me to say. Here it comes. I'm God. Worship me. And the whole world's going to go, oh, okay. 
and the whole world will worship him. So then he'll stop the sacrifice, and then the great tribulation will start. And then he's going to say, and to show that you have allegiance and loyalty to me, I'm going to, I have this system where you can show your loyalty to one another. Mark on your right hand or forehead. And, and you get that to show your loyalty, and then you can participate. If you don't, I'm going to chop your head off. So then we have the great tribulation for three and a half years where we are not are trying to avoid the mark that worships him and make it to the end, and then Jesus returns. How many of you have heard that? Okay. However, if we go back to 20, end of 2019, beginning of 2020, the toxin showed up, the corona took over the world, the crown conquered the whole world, and that first horseman is wearing a crown, and there's a bow in his hand, it means toxin, which is, means poison. It turned into the word, that's where toxic comes from. You guys heard me talk about that in the past. So we have that now. So that thing now is taking over every, the whole world, and every country is wrestling with it now. There's a few holdouts, but the ones that hold out, like there was a few in Africa and in the third world, they, those presidents and dictators, they disappear. When they hold out, they die. And we've had five already die. You guys heard? Okay. So the world's not going to tolerate that. They need to cooperate with the toxin and the mandate. And now here we have it coming, the mandatory, compulsory. I'm trying to watch my words so I don't get strikes. But we're facing that now. It's affecting all of us. Whether, whether it's us personally or family members, our children are going to be forced eventually, college students. I'm hearing the reports from everywhere. So what we read in the Bible about the mandatory compulsory thing, and at this point it's not on here or here, it's on its way there. So all of a sudden we're, we're looking at Bible prophecy, but the, uh, the, the other things I just mentioned, they didn't happen, did they? They didn't happen. So, and by the way, I said last week, the war of Ezekiel will not happen the way we're looking for it, because if we really looked at the Bible, the war of Ezekiel happens, the Gog-Magog war happens at the end of the millennium. It says it in Revelation. Gog and Magog will gather. It says it. So, and we're going to go into that in a future sermon. But the abomination of desolation has been told that, okay, so here's the way, getting back to, the, to that guy. So we have the seven years starting here. Israel starts to sacrifice, 1,260 sacrifices. And then in the middle of the, se the seven years, the guy goes in there, says he's God. And that event, that little thing that he did, is the abomination, him going into the temple and saying, I'm God, is an abomination in the eyes of God and the whole world of desolation. So abomination means a terrible, horrible, ugly, dirty, unholy. It, it means a lot of things. It's, it, God hates it. It's abominable. In Proverbs 6, it says, these things are an abomination to the Lord. There are six things the Lord hates. No, seven. And he has the list, arrogant look and feet running rapidly to evil. These are an abomination. So abominations are horrible sins that God does not like. So the, the Antichrist guy, him doing that traditionally is an abomination when he does that. But folks, if you guys, because some of you are, have already written me and you're trying to correct me and you're trying to school me and you're trying to say, no, -uh, Nathan, that's what it is. I'm, I, I challenge you. I challenge you to listen to everything I have to say in this message. And at the end of this message, if you can still say that that rendition is the abomination of desolation, I question your salvation. I really do. I question if your name is written in the book of life. I question if you understand the new birth. I question if you know what Jesus did on the cross, if you understand what the unspeakable gift is. Uh, I question if you understand this treasure we have in earthen vessels. I question it because to say that a guy walking into the temple and saying he's God is when everyone lifts up their eyes and goes, wow, that is a terrible thing in comparison to what had been going on for three and a half years in the temple. According to that rendition, there was three and a half years worth of sacrifices done in the temple. I have heard Christian Bible scholars and prophecy teachers on the radio 
on the internet say they're we are so excited that Temple Institute in Israel is getting all the the vessels together and the utensils and they're building them and they're getting the ephod and the priestly garments and all that. They're getting everything ready to do the sacrifice. And they're looking for that red heifer. They're going to do it. And when they do it, I'm going to sell tickets. We're going to take a team uh, of listeners. You want to buy tickets? And we can go together and we'll sit there and we're going to film it. It's going to be a, an exciting time of Bible prophecy to watch Israel do a sacrifice. If some of you have heard something like that, or you have thought to yourself, wow, when Israel does that, I would like in on that. I hope it's on YouTube. I hope it is. Let me say this, folks. Well, I don't want to get ahead of myself. I, let, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Let me just explain it this way. Go to Matthew chapter 23. At the end of Matthew Jesus started sharing what was going to happen in the end times. Matthew 24 is very, very famous, the Olivet Discourse, and he talks about all the signs that we would be looking for. He kind of gives a snapshot, and the things that he mentions also coincide with Revelation, and also the things he mentions can be found in the Old Testament. So what Jesus was mentioning was a template, a, a script, bullet points that we could also find and look in, even deeper in other parts of Scripture. So Matthew 24 is about the end times. Verse 15, Matthew 24, 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Okay, I'm going to stop for a second. If you just read this, understand it. There's a secret here. This is in code. This is encrypted, and you need to find the enigma to uncode it. The secret decoder ring that comes from God, you need to find it. When you see the abomination of desolation, let the reader understand. Let me stop right there. So we were told, you got the seven-year tribulation starting here. Here's the beginning, the middle, and the end. In the middle, he's going to do the, the Antichrist walks in to the temple and does what I just described, the abomination of desolation, and then we'll have three and a half years after that to, to try to hide from him and run from him because he wants us to take the mark. But that's a pivotal, very important, they put it right in the middle of the tribulation, the philosophies of men. But look what Jesus says. When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, standing in the holy place, standing in the holy place, Mark also talks about this, and it says, when you see the abomination of desolation standing where it ought not, where it shouldn't be, it says it like that, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. Okay. Now, Please make note of what Jesus just said. This is Jesus. This is not Hal Lindsey or Tim LaHaye. This is Jesus. When you see that event take place, whatever it is, if you're on the rooftop hammering shingles because the hail broke some shingles or the wind kind of, the thunderstorm came by, and you're up there, Jesus said, you don't even have time to get off your roof. Don't, go, don't even get off your house. So based on this, if he does it in the middle of the seven years, and there's three and a half years left. That means you have to stay on the top of your, the roof of your house for three and a half years, folks. So you'll be, hey, hon, can you throw up a sandwich here? And, and while you're at it, an empty Coke bottle and some toilet paper. Does that make sense? Okay. Don't take anything out of the house and let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. Woe to those who are pregnant, and those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in the winter or the Sabbath. Pray that your what? Flight. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop, right? Someday I'll fly away, oh glory. Right? The song? We should sing that song. Okay. Pray that your flight... So he's giving some hints right here that a flight, you, do you have tickets for the flight? What flight could he be talking about? Is he talking about the rapture? 
or the gathering or the harvest. Whatever it is he's talking about, it's impending. So when the abomination of desolation happens, there's no time for anything else because something huge is about to take place. And he says, woe to the women who are pregnant. It's the rapture, folks, the gathering. Now, the rapture doesn't happen pre-trib. I've shared that. It's in Revelation chapter 14. It happens before the bowl judgments. It's in there, 14, 14. It's in Revelation. You want to know where the rapture is? If you've never heard my sermon before, it's in Revelation chapter 14 where Jesus harvests the earth. And that happens after the seventh, seventh trumpet sounded. So that's the gathering when, when he takes us out before the bulls. Now, let's put this in perspective and really see what it's saying. If you have a crackhead mother, doesn't love God, lives like the devil, re rejects the gospel, and she gets pregnant, and she has a stomach, and the trumpet sounds, what's going to happen to that stomach? You see, did you get that? Before and after. Woe unto the mother that's pregnant, because her baby's gone. Woe to the mother who's nursing. She's nursing, and the rapture happens. That's going to freak people out. Okay, Jesus says it right here. Woe to them. So we have the abomination of desolation. It occurs, and then Jesus says something is going to occur with that. So when that event occurs, it's going to cause God to shake the earth. And if we read between the lines, folks, it says, let the reader understand. Please make note of what I'm trying to say right here. So spoken up by the prophet Daniel. Okay, so if we want to understand this, we have to see what Daniel had to say about it. But before we do, the term abomination, abomination means a profane event, a horrible sin that God finds putrid and horrible and disgusting. So something is going to happen. It's an abomination that he finds that when it happens, if you're on the rooftop, you're not even going to get to come off your roof because something huge is going to happen on the earth that coincides right after that event happens. Now let's look at abomination of desolation. The word desolation, what does that mean? It's so mysterious for folks. And if you're, if you're watching this online and, and you are limited, you limit your, your Bible study to the words on the page and that's as far as you go, then there's a whole treasure that you're missing out on. Because now that we have computers and apps, you can go online to blueletterbible.org and you can look at any verse in there and hit any verse and you can tap on it and it'll open up the original words. And then you can tap on the original words and it opens up five or ten meanings of that word and the other places that word is used. It's a treasure. It's a treasure. It's You guys, try it out. So, the abomination of desolation. In Matthew 23, the previous chapter, Jesus was walking into Jerusalem and he stopped right outside the gates and he started crying. Jesus wept outside Jerusalem. And he said, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather you, I wanted to gather you under my wing like a, a mother hen. And you guys have chickens before? They, they spread their wings out and cover the eggs and the babies. Jesus wanted to do that for the house of Israel, but they wouldn't have it. He says, but you would not have it. Behold, verse 38. See, look, Jerusalem, your house is left unto you desolate. It's left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Okay, several things. He's saying several things right here. First of all, the temple had the veil to the Holy of Holies, and when Jesus died on the cross, an angel ripped it from the top right down to the bottom and opened that thing up, and the presence of God that was in the Holy of Holies where the ark was went out into the whole world. So the, the gospel could then be given to everybody, to the Gentiles. Praise God, right? To all of us, for us. So from that point on, the Holy of Holies, the method of 
talking to God and hearing from God was limited and the, the privilege of Israel and the Jews. But when Jesus died on the cross, that got taken away from them and was given to the world. So from that point on, if the high priest wanted to go into the Holy of Holies, first of all, that veil was cut. But if he went in there and tried to have communication with God, it was going to be crickets. He wasn't going to hear anything. Nothing was going to happen. The, the enjoyment of whatever they experienced when they used to go in there into the Holy of Holies, because it was a powerful thing. God's presence was in there. When the high priest went in there, if he had any sin on him, he would drop dead. They had a rope around his leg and they'd pull him out. That was scary. The high priest going into the Holy of Holies, he had to bathe five times all night long the day before. The night, he was up all night long just praying, repenting, because he knew he was going to go in there and if there was anything, he had little bells on the, on the bottom of his priestly garment so they could listen. Is he still alive, guys? Okay, I hear the bells. Okay. You, you, and you can't talk to him because he's talking to God. So from, that, from, from the time that Jesus died on the cross, there's no more exchange of the sacrifice with the high priest. So Jesus said, your house is left to you desolate. Desolate, that word desolate means empty, a wilderness, ruins, destroyed, desolate. There's nothing there anymore. So he's saying, your house is left to you desolate. Your house. He's talking about the temple. So Jesus is, he weeps over Jerusalem and he says, your temple, because you didn't want any of me, your temple's now going to be a ruin, a heap. And he was also, in, and there's another part of, of the Gospels where he tells them, you, you guys are going to get destroyed. There, no stone will be left. It's going to get destroyed. And, and sure enough, A.D. 70, the year 70, Rome went in there and just wiped out Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, and sure enough, no stone was left, and they killed a lot of people. That wasn't the year 70. Jesus died in the year, supposedly, give or take. They say, he, if we were to say he was born in the year zero, then in the year 33 and a half, he dies. And then in the year 70, it gets destroyed. But scholars have kind of figured out it was actually a little BC, a few years, maybe two, three, debate on when Jesus was actually born. But it, it was around there. So after Jesus dies on the cross, Jerusalem got destroyed and the temple was no more. The temple was ruined. It was empty. It was desolate. Everybody say desolate. desolate. All right. Now, hint, ladies and gentlemen, hint. The abomination of desolation. So when people wonder, what does desolation mean? Desolation means ruins, empty, wilderness, a, a ruinous heap. It's a pile of rubble. So the abomination, the profane act, the abomination of desolation, we could translate into the profane act in the ruins or the profane act in the rubble or the profane act in the destroyed temple, the, the profane act in the, the, that building that Israel used to have, the abomination in that ruin. Okay, everyone make note. It's very important to get a hold of this. So Jesus said in Matthew 24... When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, the prophet, in the holy place. So let's go to Daniel now. Let's go to Daniel chapter 9. How many of you, how many of you guys are avid Bible prophecy students? Do we have any here? You just, a few of you, okay. Uh, the book of Daniel has a lot of prophecies about the little horn, the quote-unquote Antichrist, and Nebuchadnezzar, and Babylon. And a lot of the events that we see in Daniel are a shadow that we could apply to, to Mystery Babylon at the end of time. Because Revelation talks about Mystery Babylon, the daughter of Babylon. What is this thing? What does it mean? The book of Daniel goes into some of that. But it also explains something that is the enigma. I'm about to share with you guys the enigma right here. And if you can get a hold of this, if you can get a hold of this, it'll change your life. 
It'll change your relationship with God. Now, before I, I, I share this, there's something else I need to share. The powers of darkness have been allowed to be loosed on earth. And God has always allowed them to coexist with us. And the reason he did that was because in order for us to navigate and journey on the narrow road, he wanted us to be able to depend on him. He wanted us to need him. He wanted us to rely on him the way it should be. That's why he made us. He didn't want to create us and then we ignore him. Who wants to have a baby that never talks to you? Ignores you, you know, growing up and they never talk and they could care less about you, right? So God wants to be involved in our lives. So he allowed the scary things. He allowed the entities, the evil spirits. Paul tells us, we wrestle not against flesh and blood in Ephesians, but against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this world, dominions, thrones. What are those? You ever wondered? Those are entities and when we get to heaven, there's going to be a lot of questions answered. But we do know that different regions of the earth, we, because Paul tells us there's principalities. What's a principality? Well, Daniel tells us about the prince of Persia that restrained the angel from coming and giving Daniel an answer. So some principality over Persia restrained the angel. So these are... Whatever a principality is, or however they look, they're able to fight Michael and Gabriel. They're pretty strong. Now here's the question. Why in the world would God allow those guys? You ever wondered? How did they get up there? If they're in different areas. In the, in the book of Colossians chapter 1, I'll just read this to you. This is real interesting. In Colossians 1, it talks about Jesus being the creator of everything. And it says, 1 verse 15, For he, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created. All. Both in heaven and on earth. Visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him, and for him, God made principalities for him. He made those dominions, those spirits, overshadowing areas of the earth. He did it for him. It says right here. What? Why would he do that? Have you guys ever thought about this? What? Why did he do that? Okay. Here's why. Because... We're told, for this purpose was the Son of Man manifest that he should destroy the works of the evil one. And if we rely on Jesus to battle and trust in him, to navigate to him in spite of these creepy things, that takes faith. It takes faith for you to wake up and know that the enemy is trying to attack you, and it takes faith faith for you to, to, or lack of faith, to ignore the attack of the enemy and just think that it's, eh, bad weather. So that's one way to look at it. Or it takes faith to know that the enemy's trying to destroy you, and then that means we have to pray, means we have to get the word in our heart, means we have to talk to him, means we have to get familiar with worship and, and be familiar with the anointing so that we can battle those things because those things want to come into your house and make you miserable and put your kids on drugs and make your kids not want to have anything to do with either you or your, or your wife or, or your loved ones, and they want them to go out and commit suicide, and that's what they do. So that's the battle we're up against. Israel, when they went into the promised land, God said destroy the ites, the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Amorites and the Parasites, right? And it says in Judges that God left them in there he allowed some to remain so that the children of Israel would learn warfare. So God allows these things so that we can know warfare. Warfare happens. We need him. We need to learn. So what are our weapons then? Imagine this, guys. We have to get familiar with weapons that we can't even see. We have to get familiar with weapons that that's total faith. But a weapon that can manifest before our eyes and actually come true. You have someone that's demonized or has a spirit of infirmity or they're sick 
and you pray for them and that thing leaves, that's, that's using God, right? And that's what God wants us to be able to do. So when Jesus came and he died on the cross, he did something very, very interesting. When he said, it is finished, you guys remember that? To tell us die, it's finished. What was finished? The covenant that he started at the very beginning of Genesis, and he made the covenant with Abraham, and it kept going, and David, and then in Leviticus he talks about the covenant, and then the covenant of Saul. There's a lot of all these terms for covenant, but the covenant is Eden restored. The covenant is our hearts restored to him. The covenant is the everlasting gospel. The covenant is what he was going to do for us so we can live again and not have to be miserable in this world. And so that we don't just appear and born and we're not just born as a child. You weren't born just to be a baby and live your life and exist in emptiness and then die. That's not what God made you. God made you so that you can be born, and at some point in your life, you discover him, and you meet him, and you give your life to him, and you get sealed by him, and then you discover his secrets, and you discover the tools that he has available to make your life abundant. Folks, the church is not living an abundant life right now. The church is in the smackdown. The church is getting itself kicked. The church is being walked all over by the devil right now. It's just the remedy that's starting to figure this thing out. And God wants the church knowing something. But here's the deal. Not just knowing something, but living it and exhibiting it. God wants every one of you to exhibit it is finished in your life. How do you do that? In Ephesians chapter 3. If you have your Bibles, turn to this. Or write this down. If you don't have it, Ephesians 3, please get a hold of what I'm going to show you right here. Ephesians 3. Now, Paul was very smart, and God recruited Paul because of that reason. Peter even tells us that the writings of Paul are hard to understand sometimes, but man, he's deep. Peter says that. So God gave Paul the revelation of the gospel. God opened Paul's eyes to the revelation so that he could then share it with the world and, and write the scriptures. But Paul says, for this reason, I, Paul, verse 3, Ephesians 3, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you, Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery. Let me stop. If indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God. Let me pause for a moment. For those of you out on YouTube land that want to write me and say, you preach dispensation, you heretic, Nathan, you don't know what you're talking about. This is the Bible right here, folks. And I've said this over and over. I'm not going to throw down my Bible and listen to you, to your garbage and your heresy and your lies. We either have to know what it says and hold on to it and not be afraid. We have to know what it says so in boldness, when someone comes contrary, we can stand firm and say, no, you need to go back to school. Paul mentions the dispensation of grace. That's where we're in right now. Make note. So just file that and leave it on the table because we're going to come back to that in a second. He made known to me the mystery of, as I have briefly written, the mystery. You may understand my knowledge of the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men at, as it has now been Revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. So it's a mystery. The gospel is a mystery. And if it's a mystery, the gospel is a mystery. Jesus died on the cross. The blood drips. You know, before I was saved, I would think of that dripping blood. How does that save people? How does, what? How does that, how? What is, to our finite minds, our carnal minds, it doesn't make sense. But there's a mystery behind it. There's a very, very deep deep, deep, deep mystery to it. The life of the flesh is in the blood. It, it, it goes very, very deep. But God showed Paul the mystery. Now, Jesus dies on the cross. He rises, and then he says, it says, and then he gave gifts to men. Gifts. Well, what gifts? Gifts for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, to continue on, to reproduce, to, so that the wheels, the laborers, send laborers to the, the harvest because the wheels, the, the fields are, are white with them and we need laborers. So we need people to understand the mysteries and this is what we need to be up, the church needs to get a hold of. I'm about to show you something that the church has no clue about. 
And because they have no clue about this, they are misinterpreting Daniel 9.27. And that's where we're going to go in a second. If the church does not get a hold of this, actually, no, let me rephrase that. Because the church does not understand this, the church is getting walloped. So many people in the church are, are getting overcome. They are. Now go to verse 8. To me, who am less than the least of all saints, the grace was given, and I should preach among that I should preach among the Gentiles. Preach what? The unsearchable riches of Christ. Unsearchable. We can't even search them out. So how's he teaching them? That means that we need God's help for the revelation. Our eyes need to be open. That's why I was saying we need to do that prayer of Bartimaeus. God, open my eyes. Because they are unsearchable riches that the average person is not going to know. It goes on. The unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery. The fellowship of the mystery. We are part of the body of Christ. We are part of a fellowship, but we're also a part of the body of Christ, of a fellowship that is a mystery. What? It's a mystery? If it's a mystery, we've got to find out, right, guys? And if you are a true child of God and you hear that, that you're a part of a fellowship, but there's a mystery there, but it's available for you, but in order for you to get it, you got to do certain things, and then God will let you have here and there, a little bit here and there, a little bit of the nuggets of truth. We have to want it. We have to want it. The, the, the parable of the talents. He gave one person ten, another five, and another one. The person who had ten, well, what are talents in the first place? What are those? It says in Romans, to each of us, we have been given a measure of faith. Everyone has a different measure. He gives a little bit. And with what he gives us, it is up to us to make that grow and to be hungry, hungry for more and also to be hungry for more to, to, to understand the riches of what he has for the body of Christ. We have to want that. If there's no hunger inside any of you that are listening, if you have no hunger for the word of God, then you're dead. And you're probably not saved. Let me say that. Or you have to return to your first love. Or you have unrepentant sin. Because there's no hunger for the word of God. And if there's no hunger for the word of God, again, I can't say this enough, folks, you will not understand what's going on. You will be traveling with your eyes closed in darkness and you'll fall into a snare and a pit and there's traps all around us. We have to navigate through the gauntlet of the tribulation. So we need him so much, guys. We need him. So to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in Christ. It was hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ. The mystery is hidden since the beginning of time, throughout all the ages. It was hidden in God and Jesus who, who made everything, including those dominions and principalities and thrones and all that. We just read that in Colossians. So this mystery is hidden. I want to know, folks, how many of you guys want to know more, right? Amen? And that's the attitude we should have. But watch this. It was hidden to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church. Now it needs to be made known by the church. And look what it says. Made known by the church to the principalities and powers in heavenly places. What? God has a mystery. He has the gospel. This treasure we have in our earthen vessels he offers us abundant life. He offers us power to tread on serpents and scorpions. Paul tells us we wrestle against these creepy things up there. And it says right here that the church, with God's wisdom, can have unlocked to them the mysteries of God. And then thereby, the church is, here's what it means. The church is thereby going to serve notice. You guys, if you're part of the church... If you're a part of the body of Christ, if he lives in you, you by your life, by living by faith, by understanding the mysteries and by being hungry for him, by acting how you're supposed to, by being pleasing to him, you will serve notice to the principalities and powers. They will know who you are. 
They'll know who you are. And they'll know you're something to be reckoned with. It's going to get their attention. But also, you're going to have the tools to deal with them. The principalities and powers. Folks, this is so important. And this is only available. It's only available because we understand the mysteries of the gospel and the mystery of the shed blood of Jesus and the power of his resurrection and the power of what the blood can do. That's the only reason that we're able to face off with those guys. Now, if we go to Daniel chapter 9, this is a very, very famous passage, Daniel 9.27. Before I read it, I want to say this. The majority of the church is looking at this verse with blasphemy. They are blaspheming the blood of Jesus, the sacrifice of the cross, what Jesus did. He died for us. He, he rose again. He offered to us salvation. He offered to us restitution. He offers to us the ministry of reconciliation and all of that, glorified bodies, the first fruits, all of that that the church says they know about. But by reading this verse wrong, they are taking all of that and tramp, putting it on the ground and stepping on it and making it of none effect. Now, folks, I know I said something very, very serious, but because the church does not have a hold of this verse, they're getting their butts kicked. That's why. That's what's happening. The church does not understand its position here on earth. The church does not understand what Jesus did. They don't understand the gospel. And the church is so... Let me rephrase that. There are Christians who are so addicted to doom news on YouTube the late, and that's why I talk about it so much. I say, you guys, your, your nourishment's not going to come from just watching video after video after video about the toxin, and you don't get the word hidden in your heart. You're not going to make it. And then if you keep repeating the same lies, you're not going to make it. Because first of all, what if you do get it? What's your plan then? I know what most plan people's plan is. I, I know. And, and you guys know as well. Get ivermectin, go to frontline doctors and, and pay $90 and get a prescription from them and then go to your pharmacy and you have ivermectin. Then you can deal with that thing out there, the C. Ivermectin is, is your salvation. Or hydrochloric, right? That other one? And then make sure you do vitamin D. And it's good to be healthy. I'm not saying it's not. But ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to say something bold right here. I have already dealt with it on several occasions. And I've, I shared that a few weeks ago. Did you guys hear my testimony about it? Did you? Allison and I had it, and we were praying for two weeks to get healed. Nothing was happening. And then the Lord shared what I needed to do with spiritual warfare. We did it. We started worshiping God, and we were healed. Two weeks of dealing with the Delta. That was like two months ago. It, it, it was bad. Allison was down to 10%, right, of your battery. That's what you said. And we worshiped God. We sang Jesus' name above all names. We rebuked him. We did spiritual warfare, and, and we were healed. So if we're in the tribulation, and you get it, you're a believer, because people are shedding. The spike protein is shedding. And if you get it, and you don't happen to have quercetin, that's the other one you can get, or ivermectin, or hydro, all those things. If you can't get that, then plan B would be you pray, Right? But when you pray, how much power do your prayers have? Do you even understand what you're praying against? Do you understand how to do it? Do you understand the power of the blood of Jesus? Do you understand how the enemy works? Do you understand how that thing is actually... Let me say this, folks. I have a theory. I can't prove this, but by my discernment, and I've talked to several people who have had that, and they tell me that when they were battling it, it felt like there was something latched onto them. There's, there's a, a presence there. It's weird. It's an evil presence, right? You can feel it. Did you have it? Yeah. You could feel it, right? Yeah, and I had to go through some crazy world where I finally got like stirred up and I had a passion in prayer. And yeah, I went through like a strong delirious. I was throwing up. Praise God. Like an hour. 
And you, you were healed. After that, I was good. Amen. Amen. So you, you did the flowers. <laughs> okay, so there's a testimony right there from one of our brothers. So folks, I have, I'm wondering, okay, I can't prove this in the scriptures, but I am wondering if it's more than just a bug. It's a tiny bug. Or maybe it's a bug that the creepies, the invisible creepies, can put on people and then kind of latch on. Because in Revelation 9, those locusts are going to go out and sting people. What is that all about? So if we're in darkness, folks, and we're in the tribulation, and the enemy and, we're, and our warfare is not against flesh and blood, we have to have a secondary plan that goes beyond what the patriots are all concentrating on right now. They're all talking about Trump's going to come back and save the day. Yeah, but what if you get it? What are you going to do? What's your plan? If you're not right with God and you get it, it's going to be harder. So, okay, I just mentioned, if, if a, the church does not understand Daniel 9.27 and they are holding on to that philosophy of man, that rendition that... How many of you? How many of you are familiar with this passage? Let me see your hands. Okay, you are. Anyone? Okay. Those of you on YouTube, I'm sure there's a lot of you that are familiar with this. Let me just read it. Let me read this. Therefore, he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the death desolate. What did you just say, Nathan? If you're not familiar with that passage, that's a lot of stuff. And that passage right there has been attributed to the Antichrist. And that's why when I said at the beginning of the tribulation, you have the beginning, all this stuff, rapture, war of Ezekiel, Antichrist shows up, three and a half years later, he goes into the temple and says he's God, and that starts the great tribulation, and that's the abomination of desolation. This is the passage where it comes from. Well, this one and in Thessalonians when it says he goes and sits in the temple. But right here, it says he shall confirm a covenant for many for one week. In this passage of scripture, one week is seven years. So for seven years, he is going to confirm, confirm a covenant. Now, traditional Christianity says that this is the Antichrist making a peace treaty with Israel. But in the middle of the seven years, and he's going to break it. He's going to break the covenant, the peace treaty. How many of you have heard this? Okay. It comes from here. He shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. Let's break this down. Let's find out if the church is following a fable. And what we're going to do is we're going to look only to the Bible. We don't need to know Jewish culture. We don't need to go into a different book. We don't need to look in the news or current events or any of that. We're just going to look in the Bible, and we're really going to see what this has to say. All right? Now, Daniel 9.27 is the last verse in an explanation that Gabriel shared with Daniel. Gabriel the angel came to Daniel and told him what was going to happen in the future. The reason that happened is because Daniel was living in the area of Babylon. Now, let me back up. So, if we're going to the Old Testament, you've heard me talk about this a lot, that Jeremiah warned them over and over and over that Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, was going to come and surround Jerusalem and take them captive, invade them, and they ignored him, they made fun of him, and for 40 years, he warned them. Finally it happened, Jeremiah chapter 39, Babylon shows up, busts through the walls, took him a year and a half, he busts through the walls, and Nebuchadnezzar went in there and killed most of the people, and then took the ones that were able-bodied back to Babylon as slaves. The reason that happened is because that was the punishment toward Israel for, for worshiping Baal and idolatry and adultery and all of that. So God punished them. And he took him captive just like he said he was going to. He, he warned them. If you go back to the writings of Moses, he warned them, don't do it or I'll let you get invaded. And then in Leviticus, he says it again, don't do it. And if you do do it, let me explain to you how it's going to happen. God told Israel, 
Sure enough, Israel was disobedient. They get invaded. Babylon shows up, carries them captive. So then fast forward, Daniel, the prophet, was taken as a lad, teenager, off to captivity with three other Hebrew boys that are very famous now. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And the four of them were taken captive. Now, at some point, Daniel, after years had gone by, Daniel's crying and he's saying, God, okay, it's been how you said, we've been in captivity, so when are you going to let us go? When, when do we get to go back? When? Please. And so the beginning of Daniel, Daniel 9, he's praying to God. God, please tell me how. How is this going to happen? So, verse 20. While I was speaking, praying, confessing my sin, the sin of my people, and, and presenting my supplication before the Lord, and my God, while I was speaking in prayer, the man, angel, the angel, the man, Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision, he shows up. And he informed me, Daniel, I have come to give you skill in under to understand. There it is again, folks. If you start noticing the pattern of understanding the end times, it's about being wise, having our eyes open, and understanding over and over and over. So the angel's going to help out Daniel. Understanding, Daniel. And then he goes into an explanation that is, this is probably one of the things that baby Christians, novice Christians, or even some seasoned Christians will read, and they say, I, I don't know, I'll leave it to the pastor to explain to me. Pastors don't even get this, because they don't study it. So if you, so the church is at the mercy of who, whoever wrote the book and sold it in the Christian bookstore, his rendition, so Christians will get it and read it and go, oh, that's what it means, okay. So Christians read the rendition instead of trying to figure it out themselves by asking the Holy Ghost, God, give me understanding, open my eyes, because I really want to get this. So here's what the angel says. Verse 24. And in verse 24, this, this one verse, 24, explains everything that he's about to say, including verse 27. Verse 27 is the one attributed to the Antichrist. We're told it's the Antichrist. Now, Look at verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. To finish, okay, here's what they're determined for. Now, by the way, let me say this. Each week is a week of years. So a week is seven days to us. It means seven years. So 70 weeks is actually 70 times seven. So it's 490 years. 70 times seven, you, got, you guys get that? Okay. So 400, let me, so 490 years divided into 70 portions of seven have been determined by who? By God for your people and for your holy city to do what? To finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in the everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision of the prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Right here, Daniel, 70 weeks of years has been determined for all this right here. And when this, when that 70 weeks is accomplished, that's the whole restoration of mankind. Right here. The gospel. Okay, let's break it down. To finish the transgression. That means to finish dealing with the transgression. To make an end of the sin. Now, up until this point... Israel would sacrifice every year that bull, the high priest for all the whole nation, he would sacrifice. And that bull was to represent, it was actually a reminder. It couldn't take away sins. And he, the book of Hebrews tells us that sacrifice that Israel was doing could not erase one blot of sin, but it was to remind, to keep their eyes on God. But it was a shadow of Jesus. The, that sacrifice that Israel was doing was Jesus. It represented him. So to bring to make an end of sin, to, to make reconciliation for iniquity. The sacrifice of Israel was not able to reconcile. Only what Jesus did on the cross was able to reconcile. So this 490 years has been determined, and part of that is to make forgiveness of sins. So now we're, we have Jesus in there. Do you guys following? A reconciliation. So that's hidden. The mystery, okay, so we have to be able to have our spiritual eyes because we just read it's mysterious. It was hidden in the ages. Paul said it in Ephesians. It's a mystery, so we have to be able to decode it. So to, 
make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness. Okay, so right there, to bring in everlasting righteousness, Isaiah talks about the millennium. The law of God will be on our foreheads and our heart, and everyone will have the law of God. They will meditate in the millennium. There will, there will be no bad people, no gangbangers robbing you at the store and carjacking. There's none of that. Everyone has the righteousness of God, and they live by the holiness of God. Also to seal up the vision and prophecy. What? What? Hold on. Stop. Stop. What? Determined to seal it up? Okay, so all this stuff's going to happen, but then it's going to get sealed? And the prophecy's going to get sealed? Okay, hold that thought. And to anoint the most holy. The most holy is Jesus. When Jesus rose again, he said to Mary, Mary, stop touching me. I have not ascended yet to my Father. So he... he after he appeared around Jerusalem to several people, then and then a week later he appeared again, and Thomas saw him. And for a short amount of time, Jesus was appearing, and then he rose and they saw him ascend. The same way you see him go up, he's going to come back down. So when he got back, he went up to the right hand. He sat at the right hand of God the Father on the throne, and he was anointed the most holy, and he. From that point on, he was given a name above every name, and all things became in subjection under him. Everything is under his feet. It belongs to Jesus now. He destroyed the works of Satan. Now he has the power. Through Jesus, we have a mediator. And now every one of you can do the works that Jesus did by trusting in him because of the blood. This passage right here is telling us the, 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 the gospel. To anoint the most holy, meaning he goes up to heaven. Now, know ye therefore and understand... Let me explain to you, Daniel. Here's how it's going to play out. The timeline. From the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. What? Okay, seven weeks. Each, each week is seven years. So seven weeks. Seven times seven is 49 years. Seven weeks is 49 years. And then 62 weeks is 62 times seven. So 62 plus seven is 69 weeks. You guys have that? 7 plus 62 is 69. You guys follow so far? But it's that 70 would be allotted. But 69 of them are going to be to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince. So watch this. The streets shall be built again, the wall, and even in troublesome times. When, when Daniel went with the four Hebrew children and they were prisoners in Babylon for 70 years of captivity, and then after they were set free... We have Israel then going back to Jerusalem. And the book of Nehemiah talks about them being set free and they start rebuilding the walls. They start working on the temple. And that happened for 40, over 40 years, 49 years actually. That was a project. Nehemiah, you guys read Nehemiah? So Nehemiah is talking about they go back and it's in ruins. The temple was in ruins. It was a heap. So they went back and started working on rebuilding Jerusalem. They were set free. When Nehemiah went back to Jerusalem to do that, he had a scroll given him permission to do that from the king of Persia. Arda Taxis was the king at the time of Persia. He was the third one. And yet Cyrus, Darius, and then him. And so he gave Nehemiah the permission to go out and do it. So then Nehemiah goes and starts rebuilding. But when he arrived in, in Jerusalem to rebuild, there were squatters there. They were going, you guys have been gone. I took over. What are you doing? So if you read Nehemiah, it mentions a guy named Sanballat and uh, some Arabs were making life miserable for Nehemiah. And they said, no, we're going to sabotage. When they lift up a stone, and knock it over. Don't let them rebuild the wall, guys. The Arabs, even then, did not want Israel to come back, the Jews. So when, when the king of Persia said, Nehemiah, go back and rebuild, we can look at that date. We have the date of that. And if we add from that point on, 490 years, it arrives right when Jesus was born of the time of Christ, 490 years. And here, now watch this. After 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off. So this gets to, the, there's only one week left because we had seven weeks and then 62. So 483 years has gone by. And in verse 26, it says, after 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. 
So there's one week left, one seven-year period left. And it says Messiah will be cut off, but not for himself. Now, who is Messiah? What's his name? Jesus. So Jesus has, there's one seven-year span of time, and he's, he shows up and he starts his ministry. Now, how long was the ministry of Jesus, guys? Three and a half years. Okay, so he says, after 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and sanctuary, and the end of it shall be with a flood until the end of the war. Desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. Okay, and it goes on to that verse that people are saying is the Antichrist. So before Daniel 9.27, who are we talking about? What's his name? We're talking about the gospel too. The gospel and Jesus. The, Gabriel says... 70 weeks in verse 24 have been determined and all these things are going to take place. The, the Messiah has come, end of sin, end of transgression, to anoint the most holy and to seal it up. So it's talking about the gospel and Jesus showing up. 24 tells us, I'm about to explain to you the mystery and it's about the Messiah coming, but then he's going to be cut off and then he's going to do something though. But it's, we're, we're talking about the gospel and the Messiah. Now, at any point in verse 24, does it say, however, let me interrupt, even though I'm talking about the mystery that's been hidden since the foundation of the earth, since the ages from God. And I'm telling you the mysteries. Also, the plan is to have this rascal walk into the temple and say he's God. Is that is in verse 24? Do you see that anywhere, guys? Anybody? No, it's not in verse 24. But the church tells us verse 27 is about the Antichrist. So let's now start breaking it down. After 62 weeks, verse 26, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. Why was Messiah cut off? What happened to him? He was, what's that? You guys agree? Because it's quiet. Are you, you guys, okay, why did Jesus get cut off? Guys, come on. What happened to him? Okay, so I, let's all say it together. He was what? Crucified. Thank you. Thank you, because we want the YouTube folks to understand it's about crucifixion. You guys got that. Messiah was cut off because he was crucified, but not for himself. It was for us, for you. All right. But not for himself. And the people, okay. So verse 26 says, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. We're talking about Messiah, right? Do we agree? The next sentence. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Here's what the confused evangelical teachers who do not understand eschatology. They say, Messiah the prince gets cut off, but the people of the prince who is to come is go are going to destroy the city. That's the Antichrist. The, the prince is the Antichrist. So it, get, it switches from Messiah. All of a sudden, this is the Antichrist. The people of the prince who is to come. Let's look at verse 25 again. Know therefore and understand from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the what? You guys see that? Anyone looking at it? Messiah the what? Okay, say it again. Messiah the prince. So in this explanation, when Gabriel's talking, when he says prince, he's talking about Messiah. Amen? YouTubers, when he when the Gabriel says prince, Messiah the prince, he's talking about Jesus. Okay? Prince is Jesus. So in the next sentence, when he says the Messiah, the prince, is going to get cut off, but not for himself. And then the next verse says, and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and sanctuary. So if the prince Messiah is Jesus, the prince in this verse is also Jesus. Well, hold on, Nathan. Hold on a second. How can it be Jesus? Because it says the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and sanctuary. When Rome, when, when Rome destroyed Jerusalem, that wasn't God. Those weren't Christians doing it. Was it? No. So it had to be the Antichrist. The Antichrist is going to destroy the sanctuary and the city. The sanctuary is the house, the temple. When Jesus wept outside of Jerusalem and he says, therefore, your house is left unto you 
in ruins, desolate. It's going to be empty, desolate, You're t because you wouldn't have me, so therefore the temple is going to be desolate. The sanctuary is going to be desolate. That's what Jesus said in Matthew 23. You guys remember that? Okay, now we have the people of the prince are going to destroy the city and the sanctuary. So what we have so far, if we can glean from Matthew 23, okay, the city and the sanctuary, Jerusalem did get destroyed, so did the sanctuary. But why does it say people of the prince? Here's why it is very important for all of us to be in the habit of looking up verses in the original. Get out your Bible app, go to Blue Letter, if you have the chance, and look up the people of the prince. And look what the original word says. It means troops, army, soldiers, and it does mean people. The Bible scholars decided to make it people, but the word means troops. The troops of the prince who is to come, the, Jesus was to come, so the troops of the prince that is to come are going to destroy it. Now, when, when Jesus wept over outside of Jerusalem, he said, now your city is left, your house is left desolate. Fast forward to A.D. 70, when they got invaded, did that surprise God? Oh, they're destroying the temple. Herod's temple is so pretty. Oh, angels, come on. You guys, I was asleep. Go down there and stop them. Did that surprise God? No. God made it happen. Why did he make it happen? Because he told Moses that if Israel misbehaved, that's what he was going to do. Now, hold this spot right here and go to Leviticus 26. Look what it says. Leviticus. Now, we're all over the Bible, but here's the deal, guys. No prophecy is of any private interpretation, and we cannot interpret the Scriptures by looking at one verse. We have to look from Genesis to Revelation, the whole of Scripture. It says in Psalms, Thy sum of thy word is truth. The sum total. So if there's any topic in the Bible, you take from Genesis to Revelation and you put them all on the table and then we make them fit because that's how God works. That's how He presents truth to us. He gives us it to us in, in morsels, in little portions. And it's up to us to have the eyes to see, to have the understanding, to be able to figure it out. Okay, now, Leviticus 26 mentions the promises. He promises Israel that they would be blessed. In verse 3, if you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and perform them, I will give you rain. Your threshing will not go away. I'll give you peace. It goes through a whole list of blessings. But if they misbehaved, he also tells them what the punishment would be. So in verse 14, if you do not obey me and do not observe these commandments then I'm going to do this. Verse 16, I will appoint terror over you, wasting disease, fever. You shall sow your seed in vain. Just go through there. All your strength will be spent in vain. And then it says every few verses, and if you stay rascals, it's going to get seven times worse. And then if you keep it up, it's going to get seven times worse. And then finally we get to verse 27. And after this, if you do not obey me, but walk contrary, then I will walk contrary to you in fury. And I, even I, will chastise you seven times for your sins. You shall eat the flesh of your sons. You shall eat the flesh of your daughters. I will destroy your high places, cut down your incense altars, and cast your carcasses and lifeless forms of your idols on the lifeless forms of your idols. And my soul shall abhor you. It means hate you. I will, verse 31, I will lay your cities waste. And bring your sanctuaries to desolation. Who's going to do it? God. God will do it. And I will no longer smell the fragrance of your sweet aroma. So right here, God is saying, if you misbehave, it's going to be me. I'm going to destroy your city and the, the temple. When God does anything on earth, though, he always uses what he has created. He uses his creation. So in other words, he uses human agents to carry out his judgment. He used Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, to punish Israel. During the time when Israel existed, he would let the ites come in. The Philistines would punish. And, and judges, when they were misbehaving, he would allow them to come in. The Amorites would come in and punish, punish. He would use others to punish. So when he says, I'm going to do it, that's him saying, 
I'm going to do it, and then I'm going to make sure the chess pieces are going to work so that whatever humans need to be involved with this thing are going to come and dismantle your house. I will get humans to come in and destroy. I will get armies to come in. I will get troops to come in. I will get people to come into Jerusalem and destroy you. He says this right here. Are, are you guys following? I will do it. You folks out on YouTube, are you seeing this? God says he, Leviticus 26, he will do it. So then when we back to Daniel 9. And the people of the prince who's to come, the people of Jesus, the troops of Jesus who is to come shall destroy the city and sanctuary. This passage right here is just merely saying that God has rendered judgment and then he's going to send in the termites or the roaches or whatever he uses, even the powers of darkness. I have the keys of hell and death, he says. But then the fourth horseman is hell and death, and it rides over the earth. So if that horseman of, is riding over the earth and it's collecting the dead bodies, Jesus still has a leash on him. Jesus is still in control. The principalities, we read, the church, we serve notice to them, principalities. So with Jesus, we can be allied with Jesus even against those creepies, right? Okay, so back to Daniel 9. So the destruction of the city is not the Antichrist, guys. It's not. The people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and sanctuary. The end of it shall be with the flood. Till the end of the war, desolations are determined. Till the end of the war, let's rephrase that. Ruin is determined. Destruction. is The word desolation just means destruction and ruin and emptiness. A lot of things are going to break in the coming weeks and months on earth. We're going to see fire. We're going to see flames. We're going to see madness. We're going to see people who used to behave lose their head because the spirit of the beast is going to be loosed on the earth. Okay, so what we have so far. Messiah is showing up and he's going to punish. He's going to punish. Okay, now, then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. That word confirm. Now, we have been told by prophecy scholars that that's a peace treaty with Israel. If you look at the original word for confirm, and that's, again, don't limit yourself to the King James. Look at The word means perfect. He shall perfect the covenant with many. He, the prince, shall perfect his covenant with many people for seven years. But in the middle of the seven years, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. When Jesus died on the cross, the angel tore the veil, he ripped it open, and there was no longer a need for Israel to sacrifice because now Jesus perfected. He, he fulfilled what that sacrifice represented, which was him in the first place. He fulfilled it. He finished it. So there was no longer a need for Israel to do that anymore. So he brought an end to it. And on the wings of abominations shall be one who makes desolate. On the wings of abomination, that word wings means overspreading. In other words, it's going to spread out from the, to the four corners of the earth. The wings of abomination, even him on the cross, were like arms spread out. And what he did went out throughout the whole world. From this point on, Everywhere, it's good for the overspreading. What I did, my sacrifice, and I'm spreading it to the whole world now. Changes the sacrifice that now you're doing, what Israel's doing, that sacrifice that Israel's doing now, that he shed his blood, went from being an acceptable aroma to God, it turned into an abomination. That's what it turned into. And I can prove it, you guys. He shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering on the wings of abomination is one who makes desolate. Okay. One who makes desolate. Now, we, we broke down what desolation means. It means the, the house, the temple, is a ruin, a ruinous heap. On the wings of abomination is one, the prince, who causes the temple to be a ruin. Jesus told them. He stood outside Jerusalem, and he said, Now your house is left desolate. He died on the cross, and he said it's going to happen. And then we read in Leviticus, he will destroy that, the sanctuary and the city. So God does it, 
And Jesus warned them when he wept. And now Daniel 9.27 is saying, is one who is going to do it. Because he says in Leviticus 26, I will destroy your sanctuary. Right here it says, on the wings of the abomination, it is no longer, we don't need sacrifice anymore. We don't need that anymore. Because Jesus did it. So now we don't need the temple anymore. So what, what should we do with the temple? Let's destroy the temple. So that the people down there who can't see... They can't help it. They're just, their eyes are blind. They're in a slumber. Let's help them out. So they're not tempted. Let's destroy the temple. That's God's mercy, folks. That's why God did it. He destroyed it. Even until, okay, we're the bride of Christ. How many of you are part of the bride of Christ? Okay. So who's the groom? Okay. When a wedding takes place and they have the reception and then they go on their honeymoon, if something does not happen, are they, they're not officially married. What needs to happen? What's that word? It starts with a C. Bride and groom meet. And on the wings of abomination shall be one. He destroys the temple. Even until the... Do you guys have it right there? You see it? The consummation. What? which is determined. What is determined? It is determined that Jesus is going to come back and he's going to get his bride. He's going to take you if you're part of the bride of Christ and you're going to be a part of the consummation. That word consummation means that, but it also means to finish, to bring an end, to cease, to accomplish. There's other words that it can mean, but guys, come on. We're grown-ups here. If a consummation does not happen, is there a wedding? Or does, is the wedding... Is it null and void or is it valid? Right? Okay. It, it's poured out on the desolate. So, we have right here. This passage of Scripture is about Jesus. And this passage of Scripture tells us that Jesus is going to do these things for us because he died on the cross. And by him doing that, then we will be part of the bride of Christ. You get to participate. Now, I, I shared a moment ago about Colossians that we have to, or in Ephesians, we have to serve notice to the principalities, our privileges that come with the gospel, the fullness of Christ, the power of God into salvation and by those that believe. What does it say at the, the last chapter of Mark 16? These signs shall follow those that believe in my name. You shall do what? Against out demons, speak with new tongues, lay hands on the sick. All these great things. Poison, the serpents, you shall trot on them. Those signs shall follow. You guys, that's power. And, this, and the devil does not want the church knowing that we have weapons. So what has the, the devil done? What has he done? What has Satan done? shrewdly done, and the church is swallowing that dangling carrot. Satan took the gospel out of Daniel chapter 9, 27. That's about Jesus and what he's going to do for us. The temple is desolate. And he said, that's somebody else. That's not Jesus. So because the church thinks this is that knucklehead saying I'm God, they're missing the power. If we go back to Genesis we have the account of Isaac, we had Esau and Jacob. Esau had red hair. And one day Esau was very sleep. He was tired and weak because he was hungry. And Jacob was making the uh, porridge, the soup, lentils or whatever it was. And he said, I'm hungry, give me some. And wow, he wasn't very smart, was he? He wasn't smart. Jacob, I love Esau, I hate it. You guys familiar with that, right? What did Esau do? It says that he he said, okay, I'll give you my inheritance. I'll trade you. You can have it. Just let me have that because I'm going to die anyway of hunger, so I might as well have it. So he did that, and God looked down, and it says that he had he was profane in his heart, and he despised, he despised his inheritance. He didn't even care about it. Esau didn't realize and understand that that was a shadow of what Jesus does for us, the inheritance. We are heirs 
joint heirs with Jesus. We are heirs from the Father, joint heirs with Jesus. We inherit. We inherit, folks. If you are born again, you get to be a part of the inheritance. But if you don't care about it, that means that what Jesus did on the cross was of none effect. Now, if we go forward to the book of Hebrews and we look at chapter 10, look what it says right here. By the way, to confirm. And he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. And he shall bring it into the sacrifice and oblation. It says that in Daniel 9.27. Oblation. Oblation means offering. Offering. YouTubers. It means offering. Daniel 9.27. Oblation is offering. You go to Leviticus and you start at chapter 1. It's Leviticus, the tribe of Levi, the Levites, the, the duties of the priests of the Levites. It tells them and explains to the Le Levitical priests how they are supposed to deal with offerings. And if you look at Leviticus chapter 1 and chapter 2 and you keep going on all the chapters, there's a peace offering, a trespass offering, a sin offering. There's all these offerings, a new baby, all these offerings. And they're in different forms. Those offerings are called oblations. Offerings. And the priests need to know how to deal with them. The flower offering had to have flour and you put oil in it and, and, and make the frankincense. And it had to have salt on it, the offering. Oblations or offerings. And there's a lot of them mentioned. If Daniel 9.27 means like what we've been told. When the Antichrist walks into the in the temple and says, I'm God, it says he, he brings it into the sacrifice. He stops the uh, red heifer from being sacrificed. That's what we're being told. But the verse says he will bring it into to sacrifice and oblation, meaning all those offerings. So that means people from all over Israel are going to be bringing their offering for this and that. And go look at Leviticus. Look how many offerings there are for all different things. That means all those things are taking place. That means everyone in Israel... If this is true, the right interpretation, that means in Tel Aviv, where you have all those flamers, one, one of the highest proportion of flamers in the whole world, Tel Aviv, they're bringing offerings to, the, to Jerusalem. Really? Really? All those Orthodox Jews are bringing offerings. Really? Are they doing that? Would they ever do that? No. No, they won't, because they're secular. So in order for that rendition to happen, we're not just talking about the red heifer being stopped. We're talking about all those offerings and the sacrifice. So that's a bigger thing that has to be stopped. That's why that doesn't fit. It makes no sense. But that's what Satan did to try to take our power away. So verse 8. Let me back up. Verse 5. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifice for sin, you had no pleasure. But then I said, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do your will. So that offering back in the day and, and, and the burnt offering, the sacrifice, God really didn't care for that. It was just a, a reminder to let them know it was a shadow. But then look at verse 8. Previously saying... Sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin, you did not desire, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first that he may establish the second. So the first was the old way, sacrifice and offering. He did away with the first. You see that? He takes it away, the first way, and he brings in a second. By that, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus now. So what used to happen with the sacrifice is no longer needed. Verse 11, And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifice, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God, and from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering he has perfected forever, those being sanctified. But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us, for after he had said before. Now look at this. Verse 16. Now, Daniel 9, 27. He shall confirm a what? A covenant with many for one week and bring it into sacrifice and offering. Look what it says right here. This is the covenant that I will make with them in those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their heart and in their mind. Their sins and lawless deeds I will remember no more. So, in verse 11, he says, I don't care about the old way. This is the new covenant. This is the covenant here. 
This is a new covenant of my blood. A new covenant. He shall confirm a covenant with many. That's Jesus. Verse 26, look at this. If we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of truth, there is no longer a sacrifice for sins, for, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy. Verse 29. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot and counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insult the Spirit of grace? That's a big deal, folks. To count the blood of Jesus as a common thing. The blood of Jesus. To trample the blood of Jesus. That sacrifice became an abomination. So when those preachers said, Israel's going to start doing sacrifices, that's neat. We're going to go watch it. That means that they're going backwards, first of all, and then they're putting the blood of Jesus aside, and those any preacher who would say that does not get it. They fall under this. They are trampling on the, the blood of Jesus, and they do not understand... They don't understand our inheritance. They don't get it. They don't get it. Hebrews 12, 16. Go, go further to chapter 12. Let me back up to 14. Pursue peace with all people and holiness with which without knowing would see the Lord, looking care, carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. Fast forward. Less, verse 16. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright, our inheritance. Profane. He calls Esau profane because he did not acknowledge what Jesus did on the cross in the shadow. So to not acknowledge what Jesus did and to not understand it makes a person not understanding their inheritance. It makes them profane, and it's trampling on the blood of Jesus. So now, if we look at Daniel 9.27... And we say that's the Antichrist when it's really about Jesus. That's making the blood of Jesus a common thing. And it's blinding us willingly. And it's robbing us of power. And the church is looking now for some guy to make a peace treaty with Israel. I've been contacted. Do you think the Abraham Accord was it? Was that it? When Trump and Kushner? Was that it? No. It wasn't. Was it Daniel 9.27? No. And if you even ask that, you don't get it. Folks, this is serious. If you do not understand this. You're in trouble because you do not have a hold of the mystery and the treasure that God gave to us. The book of Isaiah tells us so much about the gospel. It tells us about the coming of Jesus. It tells us about the judgment, the wrath of God, the vengeance, all of that. But the very last chapter of Isaiah, let's turn there and then I'm going to close because I'm running out of time. The very last verse of Isaiah, verse 24. They shall go forth and look upon the corpses of men who have transgressed against me. For their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Some people are going to go to hell. Who have transgressed against me. Okay. It mentions the judgment of God, the day of the Lord. But we're talking now at the very end of time. We're at the very end of time. This is during the tribulation. Now we're at the beginning of verse 66, and look at this. Heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build for me? Well, it's in ruins. It's desolate, right? We, now we know. It's destroyed. Where's the house? Now, when God speaks in, in the Word, He does it in these little portions that are mysterious. Where is the house? And where is the place of my rest? Well, we know where it is. He went up and sat at the right hand of God the Father. For all those things my hand has made, and all those things that exist, says the Lord. But on this one will I look, on him who is poor and of contrite heart, who trembles at my word. Okay, right here. By this part of Isaiah, we, we are in the church age. We're in the age of, of grace. And who does God look for now in the age of grace? It says, the one who's contrite of heart, the one who knows that I'm real, the one who understands that sin is bad, the one who gets convicted by my Holy Spirit and can hear my voice and cries out to me. That's who I listen to. 
And the only reason that that's possible is because Jesus did what he did. It is finished. And if that's the case, if the gospel is already in existence here and the blood is doing what it's supposed to do, like we read in Daniel, 70 weeks has been determined to put an end to sin, transgression, anoint the most holy. Remember the list we read in Daniel? Look at this. That means that in the future, verse 3 will be in, in motion. He who kills a bull, it will be as if he is slaying a man. And he who sacrifices a lamb, it will be as if he is breaking a dog's neck. And he who offers a grain offering, as if he offers swine's blood. And he who burns incense, it's like if he blesses an idol. Just as they have chosen their ways, and their soul delights in their abominations. Right here, we are told that the abomination is the sacrifice. Period. The sacrifice. If Israel starts doing the sacrifice again, the Temple Institute, and they're working on it, that's going to be the abomination of desolation, folks. That's it. Now, if God calls it an abomination right here, you guys see it? You guys have your Bible? Okay. If he says sacrifice, offering, is an abomination, we go to Dan Daniel 9.27. He will bring an end to the sacrifice and offering. Why? Because he died on the cross and there's no longer a need for it on the wings of abomination, for the overspreading. So by him dying, that means from that point on, it's an abomination. That's what that means. That's what it means. So now, watch this. So if we go back to the beginning of, de uh, of the tribulation that we've been told traditionally, it starts here and then for seven years, and then there's a middle. At the beginning of the tribulation, Israel's going to start sacrificing. Have you guys heard this? Have you heard it? Let me see your hands if, if you've heard. Okay. Day one, they abomination. Day two, trampled on the blood of Jesus. Day three, abomination. Day four, breaking a, a dog's neck, break swine's blood. Abomination, trampling on the blood of Jesus. But then in the middle, after 1,260 of those things, some knucklehead walks in and says, hey, everybody, I'm God. And that's going to shock heaven? That's going to be the abomination, really? When everything before that is happening, trampling on the blood of Jesus, and Christians are excited to see the red heifer sacrificed? Do you guys see this? So when, when, when it's, now let's go to Matthew 24. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, and you're on the top of the roof of the house, you don't even have time to go down because God's going to be mad. He's going to be angry and he's going to shake the earth. That's, that's something to look forward to. If we see that they're about to do it, you better, folks, sackcloth and ashes time. You better repent. You better get everything out of the closet. You better dump those drawers out, empty the pockets, and turn yourself upside down and get on the altar and let God season you with fire for a while. That's the time we're living in. And this is how serious it is. So what I just shared with you guys, tell me if this is good stuff. Let me see your hands. Amen? Okay. But the church does not see this. The church is looking for some guy to have a peace treaty. And thereby, thereby, they're going to ignore the, the, the real abomination. And what are they doing with their inheritance? Esau was profane because he didn't value his inheritance. And Satan has done a number on the church by making them do this. Throwing away the inheritance, dismissing the power of God, dismissing what Jesus did on the cross. He confirmed the covenant. But now, the church, it's the peace treaty. And that's why, ladies and gentlemen, that is why I stated last week, it's never going to happen, a peace treaty. If it does, it'll be a counterfeit, but that's not the fulfillment. It is not. Now, if there's any of you that want to argue with me and you want to say, nah, -uh, then I can't help you. If you want to be like Esau and dismiss your inheritance and have your name blotted out, that's your choice. By the way, for those of you who, who write me and you say, there's no such thing as, as uh, Nathan, you, you said there's not one, you can lose your salvation. I have never said you can lose your salvation. What I have said is you can walk away. You can, you can dismiss it. You can throw it away. Or it never grabbed. Or, by your behavior, acting like a hypocrite, 
God will blot you out because the churches in Revelation, Jesus says, if you overcome, I will not blot your name out. I just read in Hebrews chapter 10, if anyone tramples on the blood of Jesus, it is impossible because there, you guys, we need to take this seriously. We need to really, really get a hold of this. This is serious stuff. The end of Isaiah. Okay, it says that it's an abomination, but the very last passage, they shall go forth and look at the corpses of men who have sinned against me where the worm does not die. Hell is going to, has a mouth open wide and people are going to pour into it. If you belong to a church body and they're still preaching this confusion, then you're going to have to evaluate some things. You're going to have to pray about some things, my friend, because this is how serious it is. In order for us to navigate through the tribulation, our shield and buckler is the truth. We have to have the whole of Scripture. We have to understand it. Now, some of you might be saying, well, Nathan, all this stuff you shared, man, that was deep. I can't do that. I can't do that. No, probably not. But you can sure listen and tune in. But you can also, you have the Holy Spirit to ask you to just ask Him. Get familiar with word studies. Get familiar with your Bible. Get familiar with praying. Get familiar with worship. Ladies and gentlemen, this is where we are. This is where we are, and we're just getting started. God wants to see you make it. God wants to see you endure. He wants to see you overcome, and he doesn't want you to fall by the wayside. And the only way that that's going to happen is to get familiar with what is written in this word right here. Amen? Amen. All right, well, I am going to bring this to a close. All right, that was our latest message about the abomination of desolation. And as you heard, it's very complex, but then it is also simple. It's the mystery of God. And that mystery has always been written in the scriptures. But we uncovered it, and we're going to continue uncovering mysteries like this. This is only the beginning, folks. We're going to be going into these things very deep. We're going to do this continually so that you can be blessed. And if you are not right with God, if you're not at the place that you're supposed to be, if you're struggling with sin and entanglements and temptations, my friend, give your heart to God. Come to the foot of the cross and pray to him. Come to the foot of the cross and repent to him and he'll forgive. Because right now, folks, we can't be taking chances. The remnant of God and believers in Christ and Christians cannot afford to be taking chances right now with their salvation. So my friend, I want to encourage you to come to the foot of the cross because Jesus is waiting because he loves you. All right, my friend. And with that, I'll say goodbye. And until the next message, stay safe, stay vigilant, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.